Yes, I will. Chords, intro. All right, good morning. It's good to see you. You guys go ahead and believe sign. It's good to see you this morning. Got a couple quick announcements, then I want to read some scripture, and we're going to head right into worship this morning. First of all, there is a lost and found that we said once, twice, gone last week, but we gave you more grace. It's out there still this week, but it is going this week. So look at it carefully. There was a couple of nice pieces out there. It's going to Trinity Mission this week. We're not going to do Goodwill anymore because, well, I'm just not going to say things, but we'll move towards Trinity because they support an addiction program, and that's good support. All right, so lost and found. Look at the table. Don't take it if it's not yours. But if it is yours, take it. Back to school. Aren't we having fun? Parents are going, yeah. Kids are going, yeah. All right. I think that's really all I have. Stand with me as we uh, read some scripture. And engage with the Lord this morning. We're going to start with a song, not this one. This is kind of a song we're going to sing in a minute, but the song we're going to start with is Raise a Hallelujah. And sometimes when we listen to songs or we do songs and we go through the motions of the songs, we don't ever really figure out, why would I do that? Well, Raise a Hallelujah is very biblical and very scriptural. Psalm 63, David wrote a psalm, and it was at the time when David was in a deep wilderness in Judah. He was in a rough place. Well, the context of this song is was written out of a very desperate place, a very hard place, where someone in the congregation who they thought they might lose their son because he was in the hospital and there was an emergency situation. So one of the things that happened out of this song was that they began to just lift their voices in praise because worship and praise is a whip weapon of our warfare. Amen. You don't sound like you're convinced, but trust me, it is part of your warfare. So David said, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. You ever been there in that dark place in the wilderness where you feel like you want to just not exist anymore? I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting my hands to you in prayer and in worship. Lord, this morning we come to you and we lift our voices, we lift our hands, we lift our hearts. We long for you. We seek you out, oh God. We pray for a spirit of worship to literally cover this place this morning. That you would incite and stir in us the truth that you are enthroned on the praises of your people. When we worship you, when we praise you, when we give you our best sacrifice of praise, you come and you dwell among us. We pray, oh God, that you would come and dwell among us as we praise and worship you this morning. Amen.
right, can, can you just imagine what an army of believers could do in warfare against the kingdom of darkness if we would just do our part? Now listen, this morning you, I, I, last week I was so off base and I didn't even feel like coming. I wanted to stay home. You know, you've heard the story before, but I came anyway because it's my job. I got to. But it's like this morning, it's like the Lord has just been pouring through me and speaking through me. We need to do what we need to do as believers to fight against the kingdom of darkness. And worship and praise is part of the warfare that we have. That doesn't mean you have to get silly and crazy. It just simply means that you engage. Okay? So engage in however that feels good for you. But part of that is also... Don't just be comfortable, but ask the Lord this morning, what would you want me to do? And he might just simply say, put your hands together, it won't hurt you. Because you do it all the time at your kids' t-ball games. You do it all the time at a concert that's secular and worldly. So why not that much more for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Come on, let's do it. Let's put our hands together. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, man, this feels awkward. Oh, I don't know. We should clap in church. Tell me why we shouldn't clap in church. Because it's biblical. It's scriptural. Read the Psalms. I raise a hallelujah. presence of my enemies in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief louder than the unbelief oh, I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a my weapon is a melody my heart song. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, I raise a hallelujah. Because heaven comes down and fights for me. Heaven comes Come on now, let's lift it up.
same God that never fails will not fail me now. Oh, you won't fail me now. No waiting. The same God who's never laid is working all things out. You're working all things out. talked about this on a Friday night before, but I don't think I've shared this on a Sunday, and it's a pretty simple idea, but it will change everything for you if you really, really filter your experience with God through this. Have you actually recognized that the creator of the world, the being who is perfect, who is holy, who knows everything, who is all-powerful, who is in control of everything, the one that can speak universes into existence, chooses to dwell in this room with us when we sing to him. He's here this morning, church. He's really actually here. Will you come to him? can 
say, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, in all my weaknesses, you are my confidence, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. thankful that Jesus doesn't wait for you to get perfect first. You can come to him just as you are, mess and all. live here for a second. Thank you, Jesus.
Gracious God, you are worth everything that we can bring and more. You deserve the highest praise. So often we come, we're half hearted, we're not motivated, we don't feel good. I'm tired. You don't know what's going on in my heart and mind. I don't, but he does. And in spite of our circumstances, that's actually one of the best times to lift a hallelujah of praise. Psalm 47, come everyone, clap your hands, shout to God with joyful praise for the Lord most high is awesome. He is the great king of all the earth. He subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies beneath our feet. Endless praise. When we get to heaven, there will be endless, ongoing praise. When we get to heaven, it will be about worship and praise. That's all it will be. I mean, there might be some conversations here and there, but it's going to be about worship and praise. You see the picture of everyone sitting around the throne, giving glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We would do well to practice now so that when we get to heaven, we're not going, oh my, I didn't know. <laughs> Let's give him endless, ongoing praise because he's worthy. I can't wait for eternity. Join the song they're already singing. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Just bow down before your throne. See your face, I'll cry out because you're holy, holy, holy.
another glimpse of glory. We'll sing once more. Worthy, 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 Lord, forever, forever. Worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am, I come. Hallelujah. Oh, what amazing love. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's amazing love. And some of you may not fully get that right now, and, and that's okay. I respect it. I do. I respect maybe your struggle. I respect maybe your cynicism. I respect your questions and doubts and confusion. But one thing that you will never be able to strip away from me is what I know and what I've experienced through the amazing love and grace of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. What may seem like foolishness to you it's the gospel. The cross. That seems foolish. Why would someone die on a cross for me or for you? Well, you see, God so loved the world that he gave up his only son, Jesus, so that whoever would believe would really connect and believe. They would not perish have eternal life. May the God of heaven meet you right where you are. Questions and all, doubts and all, confusion and all, cynicism and all, may even anger. I've been there too. I've been angry at God. He can handle it all. He's big. But may the grace and the love of God so surround you and so overpower you that you would see how much he loves you. Amen. You can be seated. Oh, what amazing love. 
come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what I made. I'm supposed to have the words up there. You're killing me, man. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Here's the amazing love. Oh, what amazing love. One more time. Thank you, Jesus. I can't end on a failure. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am. Just as I am, I come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what amazing love. Come on, let that soak in just one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, just as I am, just as I am, I come, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, what amazing love, thank you, Lord, thank you. Just as I am, I come, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, what amazing love. Wow. That's good. That's good. Well... Kind of went longer there than I thought, so um, we need to do a hyper speed for what we're going to do this morning. But I do want you to see a few things. Turn to First Peter two. We're going to charge into this and not try to cheat anybody or cheat us, but get a word from the Lord. Give me a second so I can grab a drink. First Peter two. Great job, team. Thank you. Thank you. I've always said when you guys just do your job well, gosh, it makes my job easy. So keep doing your job well. That'll make my job easy. All right. So last week we ended with a word wholeheartedly. Anybody remember that? Wholeheartedly? Wholeheartedly? I'm the only one that remembered it. That's because I spoke it out. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 31, 21, does this ring a bell? In all that he did in the service of the temple of God and his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. As a result, he was, anybody remember? Very successful, absolutely. What does it mean to do something or anything wholeheartedly? Scripture gives us insight, but so does the dictionary. Dictionary says wholeheartedly is an adverb, and it means with the utmost sincerity, enthusiasm, and commitment. So I was thinking about that word wholeheartedly. I thought to myself, self, we do an awful lot of things wholeheartedly, like work. <laughs> Gosh, we all show up at work on time, most of us. Wholeheartedly we give to our employer all day long. Wholeheartedly we will even do overtime and extra time and all kinds of time wholeheartedly towards our employer because wholeheartedly he pays us dividends. Oh, to our sports and our leisure and our playtime, we give wholeheartedly, right? Right? Man, when it comes to worship, the service of the Lord, sometimes I wonder. Now, I, I can't judge your heart. I can't. It's not my job. I also can't trust body language. Can't do that. That's dangerous. Because I know some of the most amazing people that have had encounters with God sitting with their hands folded and doing nothing. And then I've seen people crazy clapping their hands, dancing around, and they do nothing as well. 
Just because you're active doesn't mean you're doing something. But wholeheartedly, do we wholeheartedly give everything that we have to the Lord? 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to reread this because we need to get this. We talked about identity a couple weeks ago. Our identity comes from God. Nowhere else or no one else determines our identity. Can I hear an amen? amen? No one else, nothing else determines our identity. God determines our identity. First Peter chapter 2, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Verse 9, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God determines our identity, nothing else or no one else. Therefore, because of that, I will do and I will act out because of who I am. I'm a child of God. I do things accordingly. I am redeemed. I offer praise. There's lots of things that I do that come out of my identity as a child of God, as a son of the Most High, as a conqueror, as a Christ follower. What we do flows out of who we are. Now think about this for a minute. If we struggle with who we are, we're still going to act out of what we think we are, of who we think we are, or who the enemies convinced us or deceived us to think that we should be. We will still do because we are. This is why it's so important, why we've said from the beginning that our worship and our time and our devotion with God must be based on truth. Truth. John chapter 4. So several weeks ago, we, we examined the, the role of priests in the priesthood. We just read it out of Second Peter, First Peter, I'm sorry. First uh, Peter, yeah, First Peter chapter 2. We just read the, the New Testament concept, if you will, of an Old Testament model, an example. But God did not originally plan for there to be just this select group of Levitical priests. God wanted the whole nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. But when it came down to it, there was a line drawn in the sand, and the Levitical priests, the Levi, Levites, were the only ones that walked across the line. Because of what Peter is telling us in 1 Peter chapter 2, we don't need a priest anymore. We are the priests. We don't need a mediator. We don't need someone doing a sacrifice for us. Jesus already completed that at the cross. And when he went to the cross, the veil was torn down. We have complete fast pass access to the Holy of Holies. Therefore, we function as kingdom priests. Royal priesthood, a holy nation, chosen, called out by God to show others because we've been called out of darkness into light. So that's the first thing. We need to get this. We are making spiritual sacrifices. We worship God. That's the first and most important thing that we do. We minister to God first. And I just keep thinking about this. If we ever get this concept, if we ever get this absorbed into our spirit, what that means to come in each week, come in each time we enter together as a corporate body to fully function wholeheartedly, as kingdom priests, what would that look like? Numbers chapter 1 did this a couple weeks ago, but the Levites were responsible for the tabernacle. They were responsible for the setup, the tear down, guarding it, attending to it, and all of that. That was their job. That was their role. Every time camp was set up, the Levites did it. Every time camp was taken up to go to a new place as the cloud moved by day they would move they would set up and at night fire from heaven would come down and light them up so they know how to finish out the night can you imagine fireballs from heaven and you don't have to have street lamps or anything else so here they are that's their role that's their responsibility and Peter is saying that's exactly what we are to do as well we are to set up tear down and tend to and do the ministry of the work of the tabernacle. 
Why was the tabernacle built in the first place? Because God wanted to meet with his people. He wanted to connect with his people. He wanted his people to meet with him. So the tabernacle was set up and it was done in such a way and instructed in such a way that it was specific and detailed. But here's the thing that is not found in Scripture necessarily, but is kind of insinuated just by the very role and job that they had. If anybody did not do their job completely and wholeheartedly, God would not meet with them. He had specific instructions. If you haven't caught this already, God's pretty detailed about stuff. You ever figured that out? He has a plan. And when we waver outside of the plan, then we come outside of his protection and his guidance. Until we come back in and do as he has asked specifically, he will not lead us and guide us. When I was growing up, everything I did was 100 miles an hour headstrong. I don't know, I was a wild child, hippies, 70s, I'm not sure. But I headed in everything that I did. Part of it was the work ethic I got from my dad, which doesn't necessarily make that a, a, a great or a correct thing. But he taught me to work hard, give my best, do my best, stay at it until you get it done. Didn't always succeed. Then I got in high school and I had coaches who would not tolerate a half effort. You get the picture. They would say, I don't want any of that. No half effort here. And so we would give everything that we had. And we were successful because we wholeheartedly gave everything that we had. And we were successful. It didn't mean that we won every game. It just meant that when we walked off the court, we knew we had given everything that we had. And if we as priests... Grab that. See, we're all priests. If you're a follower of Christ, if you have Jesus in your heart, if you know Jesus in a personal way in a relationship, you are a holy nation, a royal priest set up to show the good works of God because you've been called out of darkness into light. And if we would do more than just show up and take a seat every week. Now, I know this, man, I, you know, I, sometimes I get in my mouth and I get it going and I get in trouble. I know. Some of you this morning is a little uncomfortable where I went, maybe. And I've never clapped my hands before in church. Okay. Well, it is biblical and it's scriptural. It doesn't mean you're charismatic and crazy. But it is a good thing and a right thing to do. And say I'd do it every time. Didn't say I'd do it all the time. I just simply saying that there is power and there's authority that comes and there's strength that comes in the face of what we're facing when we raise a hallelujah and we praise him and we worship him wholeheartedly. The enemy can't stand your praise. He can't stand your worship. He hates it. Why do you think this series has been so difficult? And why has it been so hard to move this train forward? Because he's doing everything he can to keep a kingdom of priests from doing their job. Church, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to us. He's doing everything he can to short circuit and corrupt your praise and your worship because he knows if there are people who are unleashed in worship and praise, they can move mountains. What did David do, it, do in the face of Goliath? He simply offered a word of praise. I don't know about what you do, what you got, but I come in the name of the Lord, Jesus. He's, he's, my, he's my man. I want you to turn with, with me. We're going to have it on the screen, Deuteronomy 10. Moses gives us a little bit more insight to this whole thing about what our role is. The time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the Lord's covenant and to stand before the Lord as his ministers and to pronounce blessings in his name. This is their duties even to today. That's why the Levites have no share of property or possession of land among the Israelite tribes. The Lord himself is their special possession as the Lord your God told them. Now, I was going to do a demonstration. I'm short on time. It would take too much. But, you know, I grabbed these poles and all this kind of stuff, 
and I was going to kind of put this crate, this Christmas crate up here, and I know I'm way off camera, and they're like, well, where'd he go? But I was going to do this, and we're going to have this demonstration of guys carrying poles on their shoulders and carrying that crate, which would represent the Ark of the Covenant, because that's what the Levites' job were to do. They were to set up camp. They were to go about and do the ministry of setting up, getting it organized, and then they would carry the Ark right into the center, because if you remember what I said a couple weeks ago, the formation of camp, when it was set up, because God was very specific. Specific. I want this tribe here, this tribe here, this tribe here, this tribe here. And it was in the form of a cross. Three, 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 three. That's 12 tribes. And the Ark of the Covenant was in the tent meeting area. And it was right smack dab in the center. And when they would place the Ark, they would begin to minister unto the Lord. The Ark represented His presence. would minister to the Lord. And here's the thing, folks. We are priests, a holy nation set apart to the, do the works of, kin, of the kingdom, to show others his goodness. We carry his presence with us because we have the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside of us. We carry the presence of the Lord everywhere we go. You get that? You get that? If you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a believer, you carry the presence of God everywhere you go. You don't carry an ark, a box on your shoulders with poles, but you carry your spiritual temple. That's what he said in verse 5. You are a spiritual temple. You're being built into this spiritual temple. You are living stones being built into this spiritual temple. And as priests, you carry the presence of God. Now think about this. That means anywhere and everywhere and all places that you go, every door that you open, you carry the presence of the God of the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now do you think he wants to always go into the places that you go? Huh? 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 No. I am hard of hearing. I'm going to work on that. But the opportunities that abound if you recognize that you carry the presence of God everywhere you go. Big insight. That means that we don't always have to show up on Sunday to meet God. We can meet God at Walmart. Imagine that. We can meet God at Arnie's. We can meet God. We can connect people and set up the meeting for God to meet with other people wherever we go. Now, here's the deal. Remember, the camp would move. Cloud by day, fire by night. We have the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit prompts, stop, set up camp. You get my point? You get the analogy? Holy Spirit prompts and says, stop right here. I want you to do something. We are so flipping busy and distracted, we can't even catch the promptings. We miss it. We miss it. And a lot of times it just simply is because we're not wholeheartedly seeking after God and what he wants. The ark represented the presence of God. They would set it up and they would begin ministering unto God. The Spirit of God. And honestly, our posture, every time we walk in the door, should not be. Wonder what's going to happen this morning. Wonder where I'm going to get out of this. Said, God, what do you want today from me? Spiritual sacrifices, what do you want from me? This isn't about me. What do you want from me? As we've determined, worship is completely about God and his choices, his desires, his agenda, his plans, his opinions, his desires, not about ours. You see, when we, this is number five. I know I'm kind of all over the map. When we as priests minister to God, he comes to meet us. 
catch that? Remember when Ron was talking about he, he didn't want to do church anymore last week? I don't want to do church anymore. I don't want to do church anymore. I don't, I don't like doing church. I grew up in the church. I was born in the nursery. I'm tired of doing church. What excites me is to think that we could do our job, come in and minister to the Lord, and he would meet us. Because when he meets with us, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Don't you believe that? When you meet with God, the, crea the creator, the almighty God, when you meet with him, when people are meeting with him and they're doing their priestly role, he's enthroned on the praises of his people. And when he shows up, anything is possible. imagine the Levites that had the role that day of carrying in the presence of the ark? Dude, don't mess it up. Remember what David did? What happened to Uzzah? 2 Samuel chapter 6. They had borrowed some worldly ideas about moving the ark back to Jerusalem. They didn't do it on the poles and do it the way that God had instructed and very spirit specifically. There's a lot of things that God has a general category about, but there's some things that he's very specific on, and we need to pay attention to what he's specific on because there will not be any favor or any blessing if he's specific unless we fulfill that. And they messed up because they allowed the world's ideas to infiltrate their worship experience. Because, listen carefully, I'm not mocking us, a man. I, I'd have probably done the same thing. Going, Whoa, hold up here. We don't want to let the drop. Because as scripture reads, they, they, they hit the threshing floor and the ark toppled because it was on a cart. You know, a worldly concept from the Philistines. It was on a cart. It was about to tip over. And Uzzah, whoo, steady this thing. Boop, fire of God down. You shouldn't have done that. David gets all upset and angry. And so... Then the ark goes to a guy's house named Obed-Edom. I like that name. I'm not sure I'd name my son that, but Obed-Edom. And what the word says is that Obed-Edom's household was blessed. You see, when you're in the presence of the Lord, anything can happen. But when we don't do our job, when priests fail to do their job, death is is the result. We wonder why we have so many dead, lifeless churches. It's because the people of God, the priests of God, the kingdom of priests that have been called out and designed as a royal nation, a holy people set apart. When we don't do our job, death happens. Because God says, mm, can't go near that. And when God pulls back, Death is a result. When God is in the house, the Lord blesses and anything is possible. When God shows up, salvation can happen. When God shows up, transformation can happen. When God shows up, repentance and sanctification can happen. Church just won't be a ritual. It will be a relational experience with the almighty God. So imagine, if you will, this setup and these guys that are looking on, the enemies of Israel are looking on this formation. you got this formation, and they're looking from the hilltop and the mountaintop, and they're going, dude, that's in the form of a cross. What in the world? And look, there's fire coming down from heaven. That is the Jehovah God that he parted the waters. And what the enemies of Israel noticed and realized as this is very important for us, when God is in the camp, they were invincible. Do you hear that? 
You just go on and read 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 8. It's chapter 8, 2 Samuel 8. And what it says is that David had victory after victory after victory after victory. Because when they did it God's way, when the priests functioned in the role that they were supposed to wholeheartedly, there was victory and celebration and wonderful sacrifices of worship. They were invincible. And the enemies knew that. So they knew also that if they could corrupt the worship, God would, and they were vulnerable. Is anybody getting the message here? Anybody getting a clear picture of what this is about? King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God, because of the presence of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf, and David danced before the Lord. Every six steps, the journey was several miles to Jerusalem. Stop six steps, sacrifice, worship, stock. Stop. Six steps. Don't say that too fast. Celebration and worship. And we think sometimes when we go 15 minutes past on a Sunday morning, we've gone too far and too much. There was not enough praise and worship and celebration for God was in the midst of his people. I'm going to close out with this Malachi chapter 1 starting in verse 8. You can look at it with me, or verse 6, I'm sorry. Malachi chapter 1, starting verse 6. Worship team, come back, please. The background is this. The nation of Israel had once again allowed their enemies to infiltrate and taint and influence their worship. The priests were not doing their job. So worship to the Almighty became defective. Okay, you're listening to me very carefully. Every Sunday we have a job to do. Minister unto the Lord first and foremost. Because we show others the goodness of God when we do that. We carry the presence with us everywhere we go. You don't get to set the ark down whenever you want and just pick up and go. You just don't get that. You are a spiritual temple. The Spirit of God is living inside of you. You take Him everywhere you go. I mean, that's, that's sobering. I mean, kind of been there, done that myself. And the Lord is basically pretty upset here. The Lord of heaven's armies says to the priests, so just kind of put you and me in this, the church. The Lord of hosts is speaking to the priests. He's speaking to us. He says, a son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect that I deserve? You've shown contempt for my name. Lord, How have we ever shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, well, how have we defiled the sacrifices, Lord? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals a sacrifice, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your local officials, to your governor. See how pleased he is. Go ahead. Beg for mercy. How I wished I could shut the door of the temple so no sacrifices could be offered because I'm not pleased with you. So I'm not going to accept any of your offerings. You dishonor my name, verse 12, by bringing contemptible food. You say it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord. It's too hard. I'm tired today. I think I'm just going to stay home. The 
not mocking anybody and I'm not slandering anybody. I'm just simply saying I get that. Days that I just don't want to. But I go back to that idea of wholeheartedness and not giving a half effort. He deserves everything and he deserves our best. So basically, he said, you're cursed. You're in, your sacrifices are lame. <laughs> Guys, it's kind of like your wife's birthday is today and you forgot and you drive through Dairy Queen and get her a gift card. Here, honey, here's a blizzard. Lame. Maybe some of you would really like the blizzard. I don't know. Wholeheartedly equates to success in the kingdom of God. When God is in the camp, when God is on the campus, when God is enthroned upon the praises of his people, when his priests, his holy priests, his, his called out children, when we're doing our job, then he shows up. And when he shows up, anything is possible. start with the worthy. Let me just say this last thing and I'll shut up and we'll just sing this and close out. But um, Worship like prayer or like reading your Bible or like anything else is a spiritual discipline. If you don't practice it, you don't work at it, you don't get better at it. It is a spiritual discipline. It's something that he calls us to do in relationship because we're saying, I love you when we worship him. I I'm giving you my best. And that takes a lot of work a lot of practice, a lot of discipline, and a lot of telling self, get out of the way, and a lot of emptying of self and asking the Holy Spirit to fill us. It is less of me, more of you. Why don't you stand, close out this morning. And just give him your best. Just give him your best.
this week as you do life. Just be conscious of the fact that you carry the living God in you. Minister unto him first and foremost. Minister unto him first and foremost. As I said a couple weeks ago, worship has been marketed towards man. That's why we have so many artists and groups and CDs and all that and stations. And that's all well and good. But it doesn't mean it's worship just because we sing to it. It doesn't mean it's worship just because it's got good words. There's great people out there doing great things. The worship is not the song near as much as it's the heart condition behind the song. Him first and foremost. And as a result, that will show. That will show. That will show. Father, thank you for this time. Bless your people. That was part of what the priests did. They stood before you and they ministered. As they carried the ark and placed it in place, they stood before you and ministered and they blessed the people. So, Father, I bless your people this morning. No, I, I don't bless them with a good feeling, happy moment here. I bless them that, God, you would pour out your spirit and infuse in them and catalyze in them what you want them to be and do. There are young men and young women in this house that don't really know their future, Lord. We speak life over that and we speak your purposes over that. We speak your plan over their lives. Father, those who, who, who may be wrestling with their identity, we speak your identity over them. The truth of who they are in Jesus' name. We bless your people. And we speak life and we speak Jesus over every situation that they face and they encounter. For in the presence of the Lord Jesus, addictions are broken, darkness is moved, and life is given. And we pray all of that in the powerful, most holy, awesome, faithful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you leave, and maybe some of you have kids back there, go give those workers a really big hug and just say, Pastor Randy is an idiot or whatever, and he went over. And, but God bless you. Thank you.